this point, we've reflected on the differences between crisis management and crisis response and defined organizational capacity with regard to an organization's ability to effectively manage a crisis. We've also focused on the importance of good communication throughout. However, the most critical component to understanding crisis capacity is to evaluate how it can be built from the inside out. Though external stakeholders see an organization's response, the quality of that response will depend on its internal stakeholders. In the discussion of the stakeholder relationship model, several of the factors influencing the relationships between organizations, issues, and stakeholders focused on an organization's values either directly or indirectly. For example, stakeholders evaluations of the organization's connection with an issue, the degree to which stakeholders believe that the organization demonstrates positive intention, concern, and commitment to the issue will influence their attitude towards the organization. Similarly, in connections that stakeholders make with the issues themselves, their existing attitudes and values affect their emotional involvement with the issue, and thus interest in seeing the organization act. And of course, when a stakeholder perceives that his or her values are concurrent with the organization's, then the organization is going to be viewed as more trustworthy. What SRM suggests then is that not only does an organization's culture and values influence how stakeholders see their relationship with the organization, but also their capacity to effectively respond to crises. Beyond simply a capacity issue, I would argue that understanding and connecting organizational culture to its crisis capacity is essential when we consider the key functions of organizational culture. So let's take a quick look at these. Organization behavior, management, and culture scholars all find that one of the critical functions of culture is to help us cope with uncertainty. How? First, it guides us to appropriately express our beliefs, values, and norms. If an organization has a strong crisis capacity, then it has structures in place to help its employees and critical stakeholders manage the general uncertainty in organizational environments in the first place. However, more importantly, is that it gives internal and external stakeholders an improved ability to cope with the uncertainty of crises. Given that we've already discussed that one of the most troubling aspects of crises is uncertainty, then strong organizational culture only builds crisis capacity. It shouldn't be surprising that if culture improves our ability to cope with uncertainty, then it also helps us to manage chaos through creating social order. Again, this is one of the reasons that it represents an important crisis capacity building activity because once crises emerge, there are many stakeholders that can be activated, a number of factors that can begin to affect the organization, and not all of them are entirely predictable in how they react to crises. One of the reasons that small businesses often fail after the founding generation is that there's no continuity plan and the organization's culture has been all wrapped up in its founders. This is a core risk of creating a culture that is so bound to the personality of a particular leader. So building a strong culture helps to improve continuity. In larger organizations, one of the realities is that people come and go all the time at all levels of the organization. So in order for the organization to keep going, culture creates a stable and expected environment. So while the culture is dynamic and certainly will change over time, if it's a strong culture, then it eases those changes, especially after crises. So why do strong brands and strong organizations do so well? Because people identify with them. They're loyal to them. They're committed to the brand's success. Now, before anyone's head explodes when they see the word ethnocentrism, we have to differentiate between the popular discussion of ethnocentrism, which almost always entails discrimination and negativity towards others and what I mean. This is the foundation ethnocentrism of hate groups, fascism, and the like. However, the connotation that emerges from the most negative outcomes of ethnocentrism but in an organizational setting, helps us to answer the question, why do we prefer one brand over another? Why do we prefer working at one organization within the same industry as another? The answer is also ethnocentrism. If we can identify the reasons that we believe a particular organization is better than another, then we're being ethnocentric. 
Strong organizational cultures encourage this as part of brand loyalty, both for external and internal stakeholders, sans the hate and the nastiness. Of course, there can be negative outcomes, but we also have to think about the positive outcomes of strong identity with an organization. So if these are the outcomes, the question is, how does culture lead to these outcomes? Well, let's get a more precise understanding of what organizational culture is. In their seminal work on organizational culture, Trice and Bayard talk about two components to culture, an organization's ideology and the forms that takes on. From a social science perspective, ideology is difficult to measure and describe because it focuses on our shared systems of beliefs, values, and norms. However, Trice and Bayer argue that by examining what an organization does, people can understand and also make judgments about an organization's culture and values. The forms of organizational culture, then, are the observable ways that members of any culture express their identity. If we understand that ideology represents those intangible things like values, beliefs, and norms, and that forms are the concrete ways that we can look for evidence of the ideology, it's useful to have a strong understanding of what Trice and Bayer meant by the forms. When organizations try to argue that they're ethical, sustainable, and socially responsible organizations before, during, and after crises, stakeholders look for evidence that would either confirm or deny the organization's self-description. This is one of the reasons that an organization's history of crisis, the strength of its brand community, and its corporate heritage and social responsibility can all affect how stakeholders interpret an organization's actions. Each of these can readily be interpreted as evidence of an organization's culture and more broadly its ideology. This is one of the most important reasons that developing an organization's capacity for crisis response must begin with a critical examination of its culture and how its in actions are interpreted by all of its stakeholders, both internal and external. This analysis can begin with simple SWOT or PESTLE analyses or with an issues management protocol as we've already discussed but a comparison of what the organization says it believes in and what its stakeholders think it believes in provides insights into the opportunities and limitations it has in its crisis response argument. Let me give you a brief example. BP is a company with a long and problematic crisis history like most companies in the oil and gas industry. However, before the 2010 explosion in the Gulf of Mexico, there had been a number of damaging incidents in the U.S. and around the world. This was actually one of the reasons that then CEO Tony Hayward became the CEO in the first place. He had a good history for safety within BP, and that was his core mission as CEO, to improve its safety performance. So when the explosion and the massive oil leak happened in April 2010, BP's crisis response messaging and its actions were actually really excellent. Yet, in part because of some clumsy engagement by the company's leaders, and because of its crisis history, very few people believed BP's sincerity. Why? Frankly, there was just too much evidence available in the public sphere that could be interpreted as demonstrating the company just didn't care, wasn't interested in safety, and was socially irresponsible. Now, should BP have responded differently? No, because what they tried to do was be as ethical as possible. However, it does explain why the company's response simply wasn't believed. Now that we know what organizational culture represents, the connections between the intangibles of ideology and the concrete forms, and we better understand how developing an organization's culture and values can improve its crisis capacity, then we should also understand how culture emerges, that is its core characteristics. One of the mistakes that a lot of organizations make, especially after they've experienced a crisis, is to assume that if they simply rebrand the organization, then they're solving the problem and improving the organization's image. That would be a reasonable assumption to make based on our understanding of the forms. However, it's just not that easy. We have to understand how those forms come to represent the ideology if we want to be successful in using organizational culture as a crisis capacity building activity. An organization cannot just talk the talk, it must also walk the walk. We'll expand on this greatly in the next podcast talking about social responsibility, but just keep that in mind for now. 
There are six critical characteristics that if we're hoping to build or change an organization's culture, we have to be aware of and connect to organizational policy, leadership, and actions. First, we have to understand that culture is collective. What I mean by this is that it's produced through interactions. This is why simply rebranding an organization doesn't necessarily change its culture. When you work in organizations or you work with organizations, you often get a sense that there's a disconnect between what the organization says it's about and how things are really done. That's because the culture and the authentic forms are collectively produced. A second reason that cultures are not only incredibly powerful, but can also be very difficult to change is because they are emotionally charged. We care about what it means to be in an organization and what it means to be connected to its culture. One of my favorite examples of the emotion behind organizational cultures is to look at popular sports team in any sport or in any country. How do people define themselves as fans and super fans? In part, they connect to that organization's history, the players and the coaching staff. People feel emotionally betrayed when they think that the team is not performing well or that the best trader has been sold or traded away. The next time you watch a major sporting event, watch the winning or losing team's fans. That's the kind of evidence you need of a strong culture. It's more than just buying the gear. It's the emotion behind the result. Strong organizational cultures connect stakeholders, both internal and external, to emotion and tie them together with that emotion. This doesn't necessarily always mean it's positive or pro-social, but it does denote that people care about the culture. So when I was talking about why no one bought BP's new branding, nor their social responsible response to the 2010 explosion in the Gulf of Mexico, it was exactly because cultures are historically based. Now from within an organization, you'll hear stories of critical moments. For example, as consulting with a large global technology company, not long after the accounting scandals in the US had forced the emergence of legislation to improve transparency and accountability in shared services or accounting countrywide. So when this company was rolling out its new systems and its new structures, it needed to do it globally. So the head of the division put together a global event, bringing together delegates from every company that it operated in to roll out these new systems. We knew there would be resistance to the new systems. And so one of the things that we knew we had to do was tie the change to the organization's culture in order to get buy-in. Now, a few years before this, the company had had their own embezzling experience. So what the head of the division did was to frame that as an important example of compliance and how their company would be better off for being more transparent. So in the context of the company's own history, he did this by telling the story of the embezzling problem. Now, was this a crisis? Nope, because no one outside the company knew about it. However, within the company, it was infamous. Because he was able to use that narrative effectively, he was better able to introduce a change to the global organization that was ahead of the U.S. requirements and certainly years ahead of the global laws that would change. But this is the power of not only understanding that organizational cultures are historically based, but also a great example of how an organization can improve its crisis capacity and institute change by connecting the need to change to the organization's own history. Fourth, not surprisingly, organizational cultures are also inherently symbolic. Simply stated, culture expresses meaning. This is evident in the visuals that organizations use to try and communicate about themselves, but it's also evident with how members of the organization interpret events, situations, and connect to its charismatic leaders. The tricky part of symbolism, though, is that it's not precise. People can have radically different interpretations of the same symbol. Sometimes it's useful for organizational cultures to leave meaning somewhat vague and open to interpretation. However, strong cultures will connect symbols to narrative and history so that people can better understand what the history of the organization is and what it means to those involved with it. Let me offer you an example. I did my bachelor's at Colorado State University and my master's at the University of Wyoming. Now, these universities are only about an hour apart and have a healthy rivalry. 
Within my first week of being at the University of Wyoming, I had a nearly identical conversation with, I swear, at least a dozen people. And the conversation went something like this. Oh, and first, they would know either by asking or because they'd see my application where I did my undergrad. So they'd say something along the lines of, have you seen the Bucking Broncos statue at the stadium yet? It's such a great bronze, isn't it? I'd say, yeah, it's great. They'd say, you know why its head is pointed north, right? I'd say, nope. They'd say, it's because its butt is pointed south to CSU, and that's appropriate. Oddly enough, no one who went to a different university had the same conversation. After the first time, I obviously knew what was coming, and to varying degrees of crassness, I'll let you use your imagination. But why did I play along? Because I understood the point of the conversation was to welcome me, but to make the point in oh so subtle a way of what being there actually meant, I was no longer affiliated with CSU, that I belonged to them. It was to establish in-group status. This buy-in was essential to my socialization, but also to make sure that I could transition to feeling a part of the new institution. From their standpoint, it was a way to ensure I was on board. Obviously, it's a lighthearted example, but thinking of the ways that cultures express meaning can influence whether and how open organizational hierarchies are to criticism, the potential for whistleblowing, the potential for pressures to conform, and even ignore risks or issues that might emerge because they would bring with them some uncomfortable truths about the organization. Fifth, cultures are dynamic. They're always changing. They change because they evolve to new sets of circumstances, different members, different leaders, and so on. If we assume that cultures are always changing, then we should also understand why. There are five reasons they constantly change. First, communication's imperfect. Messages and their meaning change over time, depending on people and context. Second, behavioral expectations can vary. An organization can have exactly the same set of policies and procedures, but the degree to which those are implemented or what it means to implement them will depend on who's responsible for oversight. Third, even though culture shapes our organizational experience, it's also taken for granted, so meanings of that experience vary between folks. The variation meaning is fourth because organizations are inherently symbolic. Those meanings can be imprecise since they're subject to interpretation. And finally, when we come to new organizations, like in any situation, we bring baggage of old experience with us. So this can change interpretations, communication, habits, and so on. Think about it this way. In short text or email exchanges, a Gen Xer might just do a one word response, essentially to acknowledge the message and then it's all good. Something like fine, okay, or sure. However, for a lot of millennials and Gen Zers, this can create worry. The one word response without an emoticon can indicate that someone's upset and they worry about that. Gen Xers may look at them like they're nuts, but it's because of the generational communication differences. Over time, this will change the organizational norms about how people interact. Again, improving understanding about the dynamic nature of organizations can help build capacity in understanding when policy and procedures may need to be updated to mitigate internal or external risk. Finally, as if this all wasn't challenging enough, culture is inherently fuzzy. Organizations often incorporate contradictions, paradoxes, and confusion. Now, from a capacity building perspective, it's possible that an organization can try and understand the sources of contradictions and confusion as a way to identify potential issues and risks, but acknowledging and looking for these as a function of understanding how culture operates over time.